talk with Father David Cregan called The Stage Door that's supposed to talk tonight about watching a performance in the theater and what makes for good performance, not only acting and directing, but other things that go on behind the scenes. Father David Cregan is a member of Villanova's faculty in the theater department. He's an assistant professor, but you also teach English? Associate, associate professor. Okay, we've stepped up a notch. Um, four years theater in New York City as well, and did his doctoral work at the Samuel Beckett School of Drama at Trinity College in Ireland. Okay, and you have a book coming out this spring. I do, I've got one book already and another one. Another book coming out, okay. Um, most recently, he directed Three Days of Rain right here at Vasey Theater, did a Villanova student theater production of Dead Man Walking about two years ago now, and starred as the MC in Cabaret. And so always a popular presentation, and we're very glad to have you with us tonight to talk with Father David. Thank you. Can I ask everybody to take out your cell phones? It's rare, right, when a teacher asks you to take out your cell phone? Turn your cell phones oh turn your cell phones on. Everybody turn your cell phone on and then hold it about maybe about a foot away from your face. And then take a look around at each other and you get to see what actors get to see when you leave your cell phone on <laughs> or when you text during a show. So let's start by turning our cell phones off. Imagine that. Imagine disconnecting. And then can I get everybody to come, leave your uh, computers and your notebooks and your bags and come on down onto the stage. Come on down. Okay, we only have an hour, let's do it quick. So you can leave your notebooks behind. Uh, don't lean on anything, but move as far back as you can so I can get as all of you into the space down here. And you can fill out the whole space. We don't have to create a circle. I'm going to stand up here. Okay, so uh, spread into the middle. Take the edges here. Some people can come into the aisle. Just spread out a little bit. Come on down. Come into the middle. There you go, follow the leader. Come on, come on. <laughs> Spread out, make as much room as you can. As much room as you can. Okay, now quiet, 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 yes, in the back, quiet. What I'm gonna ask you to do for the next couple of minutes is commit yourself to silence. So spread out, take this area down here. I want you to have a little bit more room. Take some, air, some on the side there. There you, can, you, you guys, you ladies can move all the way over into that area over there. As long as you can still see me, stand with both of your feet flat on the ground. Let your, take a peek down at your feet and make sure that your feet are parallel with one another. Now let your hands fall at the side of your body with your palms facing your thighs. Stand up straight. Rise up tall by elongating the back of your neck rather than lifting your chin. So try to keep your chin level. Interlace your fingers behind your back and then straighten out your arms and press your knuckles down towards your heels. Drop your head back. Ah, oh, see how it feels <laughs> when you're at a computer all day? Lift the, hands up off the, lift the hands off your seat and keep the arms straight and try to lift the hands up a little higher, a little higher. And then release the arms and shake out the shoulders, shake out the arms, drop your chin to your chest. Drop your head back, open your mouth. This is the one time it's okay, to, it's okay to be a mouth breather here. Bring your chin to your chest. Roll your, chin, roll your head up onto your right shoulder. Yes, your right shoulder. Drop your head back, over to the left. Forward and reverse, up onto the left shoulder and back. Right shoulder and forward. Tuck your chin into your chest. Let your head begin to lead down towards your feet. Bend your knees and let your fingers reach towards your toes. Bend your knees as much as you need to let your, 
Let your head go all the way down. Go ahead, bend down, bend down, bend down. Remember, I asked you to commit yourself to silence. Silence, silence. Stay down, stay down. You're hanging upside down. Begin to shake your shoulders and your arms and your head like a rag doll. Shake it out, shake it out harder than that. Shake it out. You chose to come tonight. I didn't ask you to come. Shake it out, shake it out, shake it out. Begin to roll up, roll up while you're still shaking. Shake it out, 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 shake it out. Okay, we're gonna do a we're gonna do a quick uh, warm up. That okay, please, folks. There's one of me and there's like 60 of you. So mm, quiet. So we're gonna do an, a, a thing that I do with my actors to warm my actors up. Uh, we're gonna shake out our body. It goes one two three four five six seven eight. One two three four five six seven eight. One two three four five six seven eight. One two three four. Six seven eight one two three four five six seven one two three four five six seven one two three four five six seven one two and you count all the way down to one and we'll pick up the, the pace as we move along. So let's start with our right hand. Try not to hit each other in the face. Ready? Five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, 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 five, six, seven, eight. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 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 One, two, three, four, five, six. 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 One, two, three, four, five. 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 One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, 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 one. Return to your seats. Return to your seats. That would be a good idea. Okay, so um, we're here to talk about theater. So I'm going to talk to you about the different components of theater that make up the theatrical experience. So let me throw that out to you guys right away. What are the things that are necessary? And think about this in a very fundamental and a very basic way. What are the things that are necessary to bring about a theatrical experience? What do you need? You need a stage. You need actors and actresses. A plot or action. And how is that plot or action usually manifested? A script. A script or a play. What else do you need? What are the other things that you need? Audience. Audience. A, set. a set. Director. A director. Lights. Lights. Somebody over here. Surely there's more costumes. costumes. Yes? Props, properties like cups, saucers, plates. Sound system. A sound system. Unless you're in here. You don't need a sound system in here. Anything what else do you need for, for to bring about a, a play? Any other properties that you think are necessary for the bringing about of a theatrical experience? Music and lighting. Certainly. Tickets. tickets, absolutely. That's basic. You need tickets. You got to make your money somehow. Okay, good. So what is it then that defines theater as opposed to film or television? What's the difference between film and uh, theater? Film and television, you have as many takes as you need. You have to do it all in one straight shot in a theatrical production. Absolutely. For, 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 the, for the actor, uh, in, the, in a play, they have one chance to get it right until the next night. Everyone watching it is there. Everyone who is watching it is there. We're going to talk about that in a moment. So everyone is in the room together. What are the other different, other different qualities? Like 
So it's a less passive um, way of being entertained than television because sometimes the actors will interact with the uh, audience. And also, what is one of the major, what's the difference right now if you just think about yourself and uh, how you would be if you were at home watching TV right now, besides mouth breathing? <laughs> You're free from other distractions when you're at home or when you're here? When you're here, yeah. Any other differences? Generally at home, when you're in the privacy of your own house, you can be more relaxed, right? You can spread out. If you guys decide to spread out, you're going to end up throwing your legs on top of somebody or hitting somebody in the face with your arms. So it's a different, it, there's a different protocol for being in the theater. So there are certain behaviors that are um, necessary in the theater as well. Um, in order to distinguish the theater from, say, television or film. Place both of your feet flat on the ground. Bring your hands together. This is one of my favorites. <laughs> you guys did this with me already. Begin to um, rub your hands together. Rub the palms of your hands together. Oh, it's nice and cozy in here, isn't it? Oh, move them a little quicker. I like the sound with all these people. Listen to that. A little quicker. This is when my back fat starts to jiggle. <laughs> Ready? Faster. Oh, my arms are burning. Yeah, you're like 20 years younger than me. Get over it. Faster. 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 Faster, faster, faster. Give me 10 more seconds. Ready? 10, 9, faster, 8. Oh, you are so lazy, mister. You right up there. 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Stop. Hold your hands about 3 or 4 inches apart from each other. And begin to feel the energy exchange that you've created with yourself. Ooh. Pull the fingers, uh, the hands a little bit further apart from each other and feel that. Feel that sensation that you've created. Pull it apart again. Whoa. And bring it closer. Pull it apart again. They could take it a little further this time. Wow. And then bring it together. I'm really good at this. <laughs> bring it, take it apart again. And some of you who did, who did early action, I, you may remember I did this at early action as well. And then come to the center and then shape that out like a snowball. Shape it like a snowball. And then hold it in your hands and then press that energy back into your heart center. Oh, it's sweet, isn't it? <laughs> it's not even Valentine's Day. So what just happened? What just happened? If I was to ask you from a performative point of view, the way that the evening has unfolded so far, what has just happened in the last 10 minutes or so? What did we just do now, and what was your experience of that? They all did something. So we all had a very similar experience because we shared in the same activity. What happened? Very basic. Once again, what did you feel or what did you not feel? Audience interaction. So there was a sense of interaction from the group, made by sound. Other things. What did you feel? I'm going to be like Oprah Winfrey. I'm going to come up the aisle. <laughs> what did you feel? Do you want me to ask you individually? What did you feel? Did you feel anything when you were like up here and you didn't think I'd see it right in the middle? Go, everyone else is going like this and you're like, mm -hmm. <laughs> did you feel anything? Yes. <laughs> what did you feel? I don't know. Yeah? yeah? Anyone? Give me something, people. So you felt like some heat in your hands? Anything else? Yes? Absolutely. That just cut to the heart of exactly why we just did that. Because everything, <laughs> she is so smart. She's going places, that girl. Um, the, what, what, it, what is perhaps one of the most profound experiences that happens in the liveness of theater, for those of you that are taking philosophy or have taken philosophy in the past, you may have come across the word phenomenology. The phenomenology of the theater is the lived experience of the theater. So the theater takes place within a contained period of time. We can't hit pause. We can't hit rewind. And when people come together into a theatrical experience, was when they go and they get their ticket at the box office and they come into the theater and they turn off their cell phones, 
they shut down, to a certain extent, the world that they just came from in order to suspend themselves, maybe for two hours or two and a half hours, in order to have a unique and a different experience. What happens in a very specific way, but in a very ethereal way, and ethereal meaning that which is perhaps not articulatable or, be, or objectifiable, but that which is a little bit thinner and a little bit more flimsy, is that the room is filled with the energy of everyone who is present. So you understand, somebody said that what, one of the necessary components for a theatrical experience is an audience. I wanted to begin with giving you the experience of what it feels like to be an audience member and how important it is when you come to the theater that you know and you recognize that you in fact bring your energy to the space and that energy affects not only you but it affects the actors. So sometimes the actors have to work a little bit harder when they feel that the energy of the audience needs to come along a little further because one of the instincts that an actor functions from is the ability to come into the room and to be able to read the temperature of the environment. To be able to take a sort of energy temperature of all of you and then take that energy and bring it where they are promising to bring you on that journey which is the story of the play and the way that that story is going to unfold. Does anyone, is anyone willing to nominate somebody else to do something for me tonight? Would somebody be willing to not, if you're willing to nominate somebody else, will you please raise your hand? If you're willing to nominate somebody, I, 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 I'm just gonna start handpicking you. You're willing to nominate someone? You're willing to nominate someone? Anyone else? I need somebody from over here. Somebody willing to nominate someone? Oh, come on. <laughs> okay, you, you, you. I, my, my trick didn't work. The people who are you're gonna, you thought you were gonna nominate someone, you're actually coming up. So one, two, three, uh, four, miss, miss, you, yes, four, yes, because you were talking. Uh, five, you, young lady in the basketball t-shirt. Uh, six, young man in the Villanova sweatshirt. That narrows you down to, is that, do I have six people now? Okay, uh, can, you, can you make a circle to four or five? I need one more. Did I, did I pick another person? Come on down. Come on down. Oh, I did. Sorry, I picked someone. She tried to get out of it. Uh, create a large circle. As much, take up as much space as you can, but be careful of that. Yeah, don't, don't, don't back into that. Stay, come down. This is, this is called down. Yeah. So take it, take it a little wider than that, a little bit wider than that. And uh, stand with your feet like we did in the beginning in what I describe as a neutral body pose. And let your hands fall at the side of your body. Stand up straight. Take a look across the circle at the person who's across the circle from you. They might not be looking at you, but look at a person across the circle from you. And look at a person to, look at the person to the right of that person, to your right of that person. And then look at the person to the left of that person. Turn to the right and begin to walk slowly in a circle. Ready? Go. Avoiding the scaffolding. Stay as far away from the scaffolding as you can. Walk a little slower than that. And that, so this is really going to require you guys to observe and to be still. Stop and turn in the opposite direction. Begin to walk in a slow circle in the opposite direction. Now, begin to walk around the space, creating your own pattern. You're no longer bound to the circle. See if you can cover as much of that pink surface that is the stage. Stay at that nice slow pace. Create your own pattern. Let your gaze fall down onto the ground. Be creative. Go to the edges, the outer edges of the room, and then make your way back in towards the center and pick up the pace.
pick up the pace again. Being cautious, being aware, watching where you're going. When you see spaces open up, dart through them. <laughs> Careful not to touch each other. Careful not to touch each other. Try to stay quiet. Slow down, slow down. Pause. Okay, just try not to act, okay? I just need you to be like yourself. Keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. Follow my instructions and don't add anything else. Pause. Turn towards each other. Look around at everyone really quickly, and then make a decision without letting the person know. Choose one of the other people. And again, begin to move around the space. Remembering the person that you just called to mind, try to get as close to that person as you can. Get as close to that individual as you can. And then begin to walk around the space normally again. Forget that person. Pause. Turn towards one another and pick another person. Begin to move around the space. Move a little bit more quickly. When spaces open up, dart through them. Be careful, be aware. and then slow down. Call to mind that person that you, that you chose, the second person that you chose, and get as far away from that person as you can while staying within the pink space. Get as far away from that individual as you possibly can. Don't let them come near you. If they come near you, move away, move away. If they come anywhere near you, move away, move away, move away, move away. <laughs> and then come back into your original circle. Okay, um, I'm gonna start with my actors, because these are my actors. What was your experience? What happened for you? It was interesting. Yeah? Challenging? Chaotic. Chaotic, so you felt some chaos? What made you feel like, what's that? Like an electron cloud. Okay, like just trying to Avoid bodies. I saw you like kind of going like this a lot, like, because your your different dimensions make it a little bit more threatening when some people come at you than other people. If you're smaller, you feel worse when bigger people come at you. Any other things happen for you? It was confusing. Did you begin to kind of fall into sort of like a lull of it at all through moving, or so you, you start moving with, in the beginning? You're thinking a lot about where you're gonna go and then it goes away a little bit. Was that part of your experience? A little bit? Okay. One, two, one, two, one, two. Ones. I'm gonna give you two options. I'm gonna give you this option. So ones, take this, this pose. Feet spread wide, arms crossed. That's option number one. Option number two, bend your knees, Bring your hands to your forehead and put your, tuck, your, tuck your head in towards your chest. So t let's see one and two. Let's see the second pose. Two, the, the ones. This is, this is, so your two poses are this and this. Uh, twos, your two poses are this, I'm in black. This is one of your poses. 
and then this is your other pose. <laughs> okay, so let's see the first pose. Ready? Go. Second pose. Good. Now broaden your circle out, avoid the scaffolding again, and this is where your job comes into play. Begin to move around the space again, creating your own pattern. So once again, I'm going to ask you guys to remain as quiet as you can. Move a little bit slower than that. Be creative in the way you move around the space. Take up as much of the space as you can. Try to move away from other people. As you walk around the space, begin to make eye contact with one another. Say hi every time you make eye contact with someone. Okay, now return to silence and keep moving. Instead of making eye contact with anyone that you come into contact with, as soon as you come close to someone, as you begin to approach them, each of you choose one of the two options that you have for your pose. And take that freeze for one beat. There you go, perfect. One person can break the position longer than the other person, hold the position longer than the other person, or break the position, quick, position quicker. <laughs> Exaggerate the posture more. No one is taking the ground posture, I've noticed. <laughs> If, you've if you haven't taken one of the postures, please take the other posture. <laughs> this is like worse than orientation, isn't it? <laughs> Good. Thank you. Stop. Let's give them all a round of applause. You guys can return to your seats. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Good job. Good job. So now it's your turn. Uh, what happened for you? What did, what did you guys see? What were the things that happened that you saw happening? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, I got distracted, guys. Sorry. What was that? So you started watching them move like as a, as a kind of a group rather than as in individuals. Other people ha see anything emerge? What were you laughing at? That's part of what happened, what you were laughing at. Yes. Why? Why? So what, what was, I'll, I'll let somebody else finish that thought, maybe. Like, they kind of fed off of the energy of each other, like when one person got more into it, the other one did. And it kind of so their energy began to exchange with one, one another, and they began to feed off of each other. 
What else? What else? They didn't know what they were going to do next. And that was kind of a hard thing for you guys, right? I mean, because really you never knew what was coming next. It wasn't hard for you? You weren't nervous about that? <laughs> that was the easy part. What else did you see as audience members? Yes. They had to be very much aware of their surroundings. So you also saw there were moments where danger appeared, weren't there? There were moments where you were afraid maybe someone would get hurt, right? What, what else? Anything else? Wow, you guys should have had a cup of coffee before you came here tonight. I'm doing like all this energy stuff and you're all like, mm. um, Experience. That's what the theater is all about. That's what uh, I've been working on for the past 20 minutes with you guys, is creating an experience. That's the biggest difference between um, TV, film, and theater, is that it's a collective experience. And the energy of the group is dependent on the success of the experience. So you can see how hard I'm working to try to change the energy of this group. And that's part of the live experience of what it means to be in the theater. So let's talk about this environment. So this is the stage. We'll start with the fundamental principles. This is the stage. What is unique about this stage and compared to other stages that you've been in, in other theaters that you've been into? It's not raised, or what we call raked, which means it goes, it's not up on a platform and it doesn't take a gradation upwards towards the back. Other differences between, say, your high school auditorium. It's, it's, this theater is called a thrust, which means that the stage is thrust into the audience and they're seating on three sides, whereas normally in a proscenium stage, which is your high school auditorium, there's what we call the proscenium arch, there's the stage, which is on a raised platform, and then there's the auditorium, which sweeps up from the back. In a thrust stage, the backstage area is back here, but the audience is surrounding you on three, three sides. Another type of theater that you may have experienced is the theater in the round, which would have seating that goes all the way around the edges of it, okay? So if you look up, uh, these are the, the, they're in the middle of a light hang right now for uh, the next show that's about to open, uh, the Bow Stratagem. So first, for every show, they uh, rehang the lights because the lights are going to have a different focus and a different attention for every show. That's why the lights aren't plugged in right now because they hang the lights first and then they focus the lights. The, 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 stage, the, the dimensions of the stage are all from the perspective of the actor. So this is stage right, this is stage left, this is downstage, and this is upstage. So when I'm directing a play in here, I say to my actor, move a little bit further down right, and they'll move a little bit further down right. Move stage left, and they'll move stage left. So these are the components or the kind of nuts and bolts of the space. The backstage area are called the wings. So there's the right wing and the left wing, all from the perspective of the actor. When we do a musical here, there, the orchestra is actually on a raised platform in the back. So you'll see that when we do Bat Boy in, uh, in April. When we uh, pick, so we, this is our space. This is the stage that we, th this is the space that we work in. And sometimes we do minor adaptations to the stage, but this is pretty much what we call a static space, that the, sa that the chairs are set in um, a particular formation that are not movable. Um, after we uh, begin to decide what plays we're going to pick in the season for the theater department, and the season is the school year, and we do two plays in the fall and two plays in the winter. We do um, we usually do a comedy and a drama in the fall, then we do a classic piece and a musical in the spring. So we're right, uh, we did a drama last, it was kind of a comedy drama, uh, Three Days of Rain. Uh, this is a farce, um, a bow stratagem, and then we're moving on to do Anton Chekhov's The Cherry Orchard and we're doing Bat Boy, which is the musical in the spring. After we pick the plays, we begin our audition process. And so we do what's called an audition call, where we post what the audition is supposed to be, where, when the audition is going to be, and, and um, what you're supposed to prepare in order to come to the audition. For most actors, if you're auditioning for a play, you prepare a monologue. 
A monologue is a piece of dialogue uh, that is written for an individual person to speak. And what would happen is we would normally do our auditions upstairs in the studio. Actors would come in one by one. They would perform their monologues. And then we would have a callback. After we have the callback, we begin to put individual actors into individual parts. And we begin, to, we begin to pair them up together. So just like you saw in the exercise that we were doing on the stage, um, certain people had a dynamic with each other that was more interesting or more enjoyable to watch. And that's what we begin to look for when we start putting the play together in the very beginning of the rehearsal process, is actors who work well together, actors who fit into the part in the proper way. So in the theater, we have what's called a type. And your type determines what role you're probably eligible for. From the actor's perspective, most actors don't feel like they're bound by a type. They're like, I can do anything. But the reality is in the theater that it's, it, what you look at is really, is really important. It's called the semiotics of the theater, if you've heard that expression before, the semiotics. It's what things look like. So once I get my actors in place, once I cast the show, and I bring my actors into the rehearsal space to begin to, um, to rehearse for the play, I never begin with dialogue. I always begin with this type of an exercise. This comes from a directing style called viewpoints. And that's a directing style that allows actors to become accustomed to moving around the space with the particular individuals that they've been cast with. They are forging relationships with one another without using dialogue. Because an important part of the theatrical experience is to recognize that a play is not only about the script or the play. The play is not only about what you see, or, not, or about what you hear, but is also about what you see. So the way that bodies are placed in relationship to one another on the stage is what's called directing. And when you direct a play, you're not only working on the way that the actors deliver a line, but you're acting, you're, you're placing their bodies in space to relate a particular dynamic, to create a particular emotional environment, so that the script comes together with the actor's voice and body in order to create the theatrical experience. Does anyone have any questions or concerns at this stage? Let me ask you what you think acting is. What is acting? Delving into your character to become a completely different person and being able to convey that person to the audience. Delving into your character, so like you're, you're talking about the script. So you're talking about like studying the script mm -hmm. in order to become a character, to become a completely different person. Hmm. Is that possible? It can be. What parts of you would you be able to leave behind in order to create a character? Hmm. How do you do that? Just keep in mind that this isn't you. They don't react as you should. See, I begin with my actors in a much more fundamental way than that with actually telling them that the character is themselves. It's just another version of themselves. So a lot of times, the way that I describe it um, in, in my acting classes is when you're um, a kid, when you're, you know, six or seven or eight or nine years old and your parents get a new washing machine and a new dryer delivered to the house and the Sears truck pulls up and brings the washer and the dryer into the house and there maybe are a, a few hours or a day or two in which those large boxes are in your garage and maybe they make their way out onto the lawn and when you're young like that you have no problem allowing those uh, boxes to turn into sort of exotic locations like um, the Swiss Family Robinson's treehouse or a pirate ship on the Caribbean ocean or a spaceship plummeting into the depths of space. What ends up happening in our human experience is as we get older, as we mature, as we become more like grown-ups, we're encouraged by our culture to leave behind that child's play, right? 
We're encouraged by our culture to embrace that which is rational, that which is comprehensible, that which we can talk about within our own human experience as perhaps being scientific or even diagnostic. And so as we age, we may become more intelligent in the amount of knowledge that we're able to accumulate, but we become increasingly less intelligent in the way that we're able to shape, form, and put into practice what? Our imaginations. Because we become limited in our adult experience by the fear of what in our childhood was the very source of our play, which was imagination. What the theater stands for within society and within culture is an opportunity for you to suspend reality as you know it and create an alternative reality. When you come through these doors, when the lights go down and the actors come up, we have had an agreement with one another that you are going to suspend your judgment about what is real for the next two hours and just about anything can happen in this space. Somebody could fly in this space. Somebody could die in this space right in front of your eyes. Two people could fall in love in the most unlikely of circumstances right in front of your face and you believe every moment of it. Because in the theater, imagination is required. It is not an option. And so you see the position that theater has within society and culture in a larger way. Theater creates an instability in what reality is that creates for people who come to the theater, for people who practice the theater, for people who participate in the arts, a moment for them to live beyond the boundaries of what they think might be normal in their lives in their day-to-day -day existence. You might not feel that this is true for you, but what society does is teaches us throughout the progression of our lives particular behaviors, particular responses, and particular ways of living in which we then begin to regulate ourselves and become smaller in our choices rather than larger in our choices. If you've ever seen the way that a child, I, I love doing exercises with my actors where I say like, you know, be a 10 year old. So, you know, like you've got like, and it's great, you should take my acting class because for some reason I tend, I must be easy because I tend to attract athletes. And, um, I get these like football players or right now I have like this really big guy who's a, who's a baseball player and they, they come out into the space and they go, um, I say to them, um, take on the body of a 10 year old and then all of a sudden like this like kind of controlled almost like you know like puffed up kind of body like all of a sudden that puffed up body goes like <laughs> <laughs> Because like kids are kind of like, you know, they're like, they're like rubber bands, you know, they're, they, you know, they're like, they don't have boundaries in the same way that we do. And then when we get older, we get really, really still and we try to veil everything. And we don't do goofy things like we did when we were little. It's one of my favorite things about the theater is I, when I, when I teach a, a theater class, I say to my students, this is your opportunity to be like really outrageous, to do really incredibly silly things. But in order to do that, you have to create a sense of ensemble and you have to create a sense of trust with each other. And that's what also an exercise like this is about getting six people to trust each other as they begin to move through each other because they're depending on each other for the success of, uh, of the particular uh, exercise. So this is the way the theater functions in society and culture. Now, you see how that works itself out on a sort of political level, right? What happens, what is the position of arts in, in, um, in American society? What is the posi position of, I'm going to talk about the arts in, in the broadest sense. I'm going to talk about dance. I'm going to talk about musicians. I'm going to talk about fine artists. I'm going to talk about theater people. I'm going to talk about anyone who does creative work. What is the, what is the position of the arts, say like in, a, in the American social or political environment? Entertainment. The arts is entertainment. And what's entertainment? So it's not something that's required. It's sort of on the back burner. It's like an extracurricular activity, right? I love it when people say to me, oh, you teach theater? Theater's so fun. 
And I'd like to say, yes, it is fun, but it's a lot of work for those of you that do theater when you're bringing a play together. When you think about the script, when you think about the space, look at the space, it's so stark. For those of you that came to see Three Days of Rain, and, and then you get to, see the, you get to get, have a glimpse of what we did, what we brought to life with like these really ugly black walls and this horrible floor and this like filthy room, right? It becomes transformed into something else. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work. How else does, do the arts function in, in our society and in our culture? Do we value the arts? So they're or especially theater. Theater is like, you know, you may have heard of this kind of continuum of a high art, low art. And theater and opera are considered to be sort of like high art and like, you know, Mean Girls or Glee or whatever is like on the low end of the art scale. So uh, the theater has an appeal to a sort of like intelligentsia or like a bourgeois sensibility of, um, you know, kind of like upward mobility in society. But what ends up happening politically is whenever there's any kind of problem in the economy in, in the United States, the arts are the first thing to go. It's actually quite the opposite in Europe. In Europe, the state um, provides money for the creation of art because Europeans believe that art is at the center or is the soul of any given culture. We live in a society that believes that sort of like money is at the center of what it means to be American. So it's a very different mindset. So for those of us that find ourselves in the arts, for those of us that love the arts and give ourselves over to the arts, we're considered to be people that are like a little goofy and a little weird and living on the fringes and not quite as serious as like the scientists or the business people or other people in the world. So uh, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a whole sort of culture that goes along um, with that. So in the theater, what we do is we bring together a series of practices that actually make us more, I believe, more interdisciplinary. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, if, you have, if you're part of a discipline, if your major is something that you think involves a more complex um, circuit of uh, interdisciplinary activities. The theater uses text, and text is the play. And the play has a plot or narrative, it has a story, it has a location and a setting, it has a particular time period in which the play is set, it's got a series and a sequence of characters that are in interrelationship with one another, and it's also a, lab a laboratory or a, a laboratory type experience in which you experiment in order to reach the best of all possible conclusions. So the theater requires the intersection of uh, all of those things. And when you're talking about the text, we have what's called a dramaturg in the theater. And what a dramaturg does in the theater is they do all of the historical research to locate the piece where it is. So for instance, I'm getting ready to direct a play called uh, Murder in the Cathedral. Uh, which is a T, it's a T.S. Eliot play, um, and it's about the uh, very last hours, really, in the life of Thomas Beckett. Does anyone know who Thomas Beckett is? Do you know anything about Thomas Beckett or, or what time period Thomas Beckett is set in? He was the Archbishop of Canterbury at the time when the, when the king was Henry II and Henry was married to Eleanor of Aquitaine. And that's when England was really sort of like France and England and part of Germany and the sort of this like amorphous area. And the king did something to defy the Pope. And the king was asking the clergy to um, profess loyalty to him. So it's a little bit earlier than Henry VIII, what ends up happening with Henry VIII. And uh, Thomas of Becket does not agree to do that and he's murdered by allies of the king. Well, today I had a meeting with some of my creative staff that are working on this, and my dramaturg for the production brought me information that I asked her about costumes. So she brought me a series of, um, uh, a series of paragraphs that talked to me about 
uh, the way that um, nobility dressed in the 12th century, about the way that the, the middle classes or the working classes or the merchant classes dressed in that time period. And she also brought me some information about the way the peasants uh, dressed during that time period. She brought me pages of pictures of accessories like purses and belts and earrings and necklaces. She brought me pictures of dresses. She brought me pictures of armor. She brought me pictures of 11th century um, uh, vestments for priests and bishops to wear. She brought me pictures of monk's clothing from the 11th century. And now I've sent her out and she's going to take a look at what the um, what a uh, medieval village in England in the, in the 12th century looked like. So you see what we do when we work with the text is not simply pick up the text, look at the parts, assign the parts and say, let's do a play, but instead we try to learn the back history of the play. We try to discover what we can about the historical moment, and then we try to bring that historical moment into connection somehow with the contemporary world that we're living in. So Thomas of Becket is clashing with the king in the 12th century in um, England. He's, crash, he's clashing with Henry. So it's, it's a classic um, conflict, which conflict is, what is at, the, at the heart of every drama. What do you think we might do to connect that with now? Because one of the questions that we ask ourselves when we pick a play is why? Why this play now? So in what way would a play like that speak to us about the, our own experience by, while talking about the 12th century. How might that speak to our contemporary? This is like <laughs> painful. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Sure, sure. I mean, are, aren't we living in the middle of, um, I suppose maybe Facebook takes up too much time, but we're living in the, in, in the middle of a world in which, a middle, a middle of a political time in our own country where questions of, of church and state are important issues, where people are questioning whether the separation of church and state is actually a good thing. Some people are defending that church and state should be separated. Other people are saying church and state should not be separated. That in fact, the very root of our country is the fact that we believe in God. And if you don't believe in God, then maybe you're not quite an American. And then other people on the other side saying, but we believe in the separation of church and state, and these two things don't need to be aligning with one another. So these are the kind of back work that we would talk about uh, in the rehearsal process. The, re the normal rehearsal process for a play for us here in Vasey, because we run like a professional theater, is about uh, five weeks from the time the play is cast. We have rehearsal six days a week. Uh, Mondays in the theater are considered to be a dark night, which means that the lights in the theater are not on. So that's why we can be in here tonight because the current play that's rehearsing uh, in here is off because Mondays are a dark night. We rehearse uh, Tuesday through Friday, usually from uh, 7.30 till midnight. We rehearse Saturday from 10 till 6, and we rehearse Sunday from 10 till 6. So it's a pretty intense rehearsal process. When I was working in New York as a professional actor, when you're getting paid to be in rehearsal, uh, the, the, the rehearsal period is even more economic. If it's a play that's an established play, or a play that has been done before, a play like, say, for instance, like South Pacific, or Gypsy, or Damn Yankees, um, that you'd have a two week period of time from the moment you go into rehearsal until opening night. If it's an original piece, you may, the, 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 the actors union may actually give you about three and a half weeks and you would rehearse during the day from 10 till six every day except for Mondays until the, until the show opens. But then once the show opens, your job is essentially to show up an hour before the show, show starts to perform the show and then go home after it's finished or go out after it's finished. Um, any other questions or any questions at all? No? Yeah. Any advice for conducting um, an audition? Because, uh, for coming to an audition? For actually viewing the auditioners and actually trying to pick 
pick out who you think is right for a certain part? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that um, one of the things that I rely on most is, um, I, it, it sounds like a really reductive thing, but you really, have to, you really have to look at the way that people look. And if you're trying to create like a couple, say for instance, you have to have, you have to, have, you have to pick two people that look like they're, they're gonna be like dynamic with each other, that people are going to wanna look at. Um, and so you kind of have to function on instinct in some kinds of ways. You know, like you can certainly listen to what they sound like and what they look like, but really it's about like the way that a person feels. An actor needs to have the ability to capture the audience, to be able to lift them up and to transport them in a, in a unique kind of a way. Any other questions or no? I want to thank my um, six actors who had courage and my three people who actually answered questions. <laughs> Have a good night, everybody.